Hirschman Prize Lecture, which is offered biennially since 2007 to the recipient of the Albert Hirschman Prize, the highest honor of the SSRC, the Social Science Research Council, presented in collaboration with us. So the prize is named for Albert Hirschman, who, like our honoree tonight, came to the IAS from Harvard's Department of Economics, first as a member in 1972, then as faculty of the newly founded School of Economics in 1974. The school was founded in 73. Uh, and he remained as emeritus after 1985, always central to the Institute's intellectual life, almost until his death in 2013. I was here in 1996, and I remember his every comment and talk as, as, as a vibrant event at the Institute. And I know that many of my fellow members um, did too. I can't begin to enumerate the many ways in which Hirschman was extraordinary without turning this very brief welcome into a very long book. But if you're interested, there is such a book by Jeremy Edelman, worldly philosopher, The Odyssey of Albert Hirschman, published the year of Hirschman's death, actually 2013. In my mind, what, what, one of the things, if I had to single out one thing that made Hirschman's work so distinctive, I might single out his refusal to assume that economics as a science requires us to reduce human behavior to logical principles and axioms, such as a principle of non-contradiction or the axiom of transitivity of preferences. Whether in his work on economic development or in books like The Passions and the Interests, or I see here Exit, Voice, and Loyalty, he was always attuned to paradox, to contingency, and to what he took to be, to some, ex the, to some extent, irreducible gap between our feelings and actions on the one hand and the sciences or discourses with which we analyze those feelings and actions on the other. So I would say that like the Greek philosopher Heraclitus and unlike the Greek philosopher Aristotle, he was convinced that the psyche is always deeper than any logos available to us with which to plummet. And he applied this conviction to a field where I submit that conviction is particularly rare, namely to the study of economic behavior. I'll hazard that Albert Hirschman would have been delighted to meet today's recipient of the prize that bears his name I have myself never met Edward Glazer until this moment, the Fred and Eleanor Glimp Professor of Economics and the Chairman of the Department of Economics at Harvard University. Nevertheless, I feel that I know him, for I've heard about him and his work for so many years and from so many colleagues. Um, it's kind of a comment on the nature of networks in academia that I have jogged with his co-authors, his students, former colleagues, et cetera, and as Dean of the Social Sciences and the Econ Department at Chicago, which is so proud to call him an alum, I heard very frequently about his work. One way of describing Professor Glazer's work is simply to say that he is focused on one of the great transformations of the human condition. Over the past 200 years, the distribution of the world's humanity has reversed. From the origins of Homo sapiens until 1800, very, a very small minority of the world's population lived in what we would call cities. Today, a large majority does, and despite the pandemic, or whatever we in America might think the pandemic is going to induce, uh, that percentage continues to increase globally. The consequences of this transformation that we call urbanization are vast, much vaster than we yet know, and it's in part thanks to Professor Glazer that we we're be beginning to understand some of them. You'll hear more about him and his highly influential work and more from him in urban economics, on determinants of city growth, and on the role of cities as centers of idea transmission. Here, I should just give metrics their due and note that his 14 books and over 150 journal articles have been cited more than 106,000 times. On the walls of the University of Chicago Social Science Building, it says, if you cannot measure something, your knowledge of it is meager and inadequate. Well, I've offered you the metrics. By way of conclusion, let me simply note that for Hirschman, scholarship in economics served both as a critical approach to the complexities, and for him, even the contradictions inherent in human life and behavior, and as an instrument with which to achieve 
what he took to be improvements in our social, political, and economic conditions of existence. And I think our honoree's work is also notable in both regards. So with that, I'd like to welcome Anna Harvey, the president of the SSRC, to the stage to introduce tonight's program along with our distinguished guest and to thank you all for your presence. Thank you, David, and thank you for hosting tonight. In 1923, a group of men gathered in Chicago um, to talk about a problem they faced. They represented the American Economic Association, the American Political Science Association, the American Sociological Association, and the American Statistical Association. They shared a common vision of a world in which public policy was guided by, by science, by social and behavioral science, their kind of science. The problem they faced was that they didn't believe that social and behavioral science was good enough yet to be able to provide credible guidance to policymakers. And they listed out, they itemized the challenges they faced. I'm not going to read them all, but I'm going to read two of them to you. The difficulty of isolating phenomena sufficiently to determine precisely the causal relations between them. The absence of what in natural science is called the controlled experiment. They saw that they had to solve those challenges to figure out a way to make reliable, credible causal inferences and to figure out something that approximated the experimental method in order to be able to provide reliable and credible guidance to policymakers. So what they did was they founded the Social Science Research Council to pool knowledge and insights and to direct attention and effort towards solving those scientific problems so that social and behavioral science could be mobilized to help solve societal problems. That was almost exactly 100 years ago today. And I think we've made some progress in the last 100 years. Um, I think it's worth celebrating that progress. And the Albert O. Hirschman Prize is the council's way of recognizing and celebrating that progress by celebrating individuals who are leading the research community and helping us develop social and behavioral science that is both scientifically rigorous and socially useful. And this year, we're celebrating Edward Glazer, the Fred and Eleanor Glint Professor of Economics and Chairman of the Department of Economics at Harvard, who's been a central figure in urban economics for almost 30 years. He has changed the way that researchers and policymakers understand the role of cities. He has revealed the importance of cities in bringing employers and workers together, the ways in which face-to-face -face interactions raise productivity, the ways in which the density of businesses lead to greater efficiencies and economies of scale. He is known among his colleagues for his attention to students. He is active in creating urban policies that improve well-being. And in the tradition of both Albert Hirschman and the Social Science Research Council, his work is both scientifically rigorous and socially useful. So one could obviously go on for a very long time about Ed's work, but I think we'd much rather hear from him. So Ed, could you come up here on the stage? And here is the Albert O. Hirschman Prize from the Social Science Research Council. I'm very honored to be able to give it to you. I am. I am. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am extremely honored and, and humbled, um, both because of my enormous respect for the SSRC um, and because of the reverence with which I hold Albert Hirschman who is truly one of the, the great uh, social scientists of the, of the 20th century. I, I brought with me um, a copy of Exit Boys and Royalty, but it's not just any copy of Exit Boys and Royalty. It's Alberto Alessina's copy of Exit Boys and Royalty. Um, Alberto was a colleague of mine who, along with Albert Hirschman, probably shares the, the you know, role as being one of the two greatest political economy experts of the past 100 years who passed away two and a half years ago. So I'm, I'm, he also would have been a, a very worthy recipient of this, of this award, but I'm, I'm very glad to be 
to be here with you and to be sharing a, a memory of a, of a great economist. Um, the, uh, I take this, uh, you might need some help on getting the, the clicker done. I can do it by hand. I, I take this prize as also being a recognition of the incredible importance of the urban transformation of our world, which is interesting in the wealthy world, right? I will talk a little bit about the remarkable comeback of cities like New York and uh, Boston and San Francisco since the 1970s, but it is truly an amazing transformation in the poor parts of the world, where I think the most interesting things that are happening in cities are happening there, and the most interesting things that are happening in the developing world are happening in cities. And given the long commitment of the SSRC to understanding the developing world better, I just want to take this time to sort of reiterate that much of our knowledge of the developing world is oriented towards the rural past rather than towards the urban future. One way of visualizing that is this graph, uh, which shows the share of countries that are more than one third urbanized in 1916 today by bins of the income distribution. Uh, I've of course corrected for inflation. What you can see here is that between four and five thousand dollars, eighty percent of those countries were more than one third urbanized in 1960, and eighty percent were more than one third urbanized in 2010. There's basically no difference, as there is basically no difference between three and four thousand. If you go down to the other side of the bar, that will give you a sense of the transformation. What share of countries? What? How many countries with per capita incomes below thousand dollars in 1960 were more than one third urban? It's a really easy number to remember. It's zero, not a one because there was no place right, that was that poor, as had been true throughout almost all of human history, that was significantly urbanized in 1960. Over the last 50 years, you have the rise of megacities in places like Kinshasa and Karachi that are poor and too often poorly governed uh, as, as well. One to $2,000 are a change between $1,000 and $2,000. And the challenge of trying to figure out how to better inform the cities of the developing world to make them more humane places of opportunity, right, is I think one of the great vocations of the 21st century. So I'm going to ask three questions today. And these questions are all going to look at things that relate to different periods of, of my research. The first has a certain new resonance because of the age of Zoom, uh, which is why do we live in an urban epoch when centuries of technological change have made it easier to communicate over vast distances, right? Um, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit about what I thought about this prior to 2019. And I'll just say a, a soup song of something about post 2019 because it's still very much a work in, in progress. Then I'm gonna talk about how we can ensure that a wider swath benefit from urban interaction, right? The, the economic definition of a city is in the absence of physical space between people and firms, right? Cities are density, proximity, closeness. They exist to facilitate interaction. And so, I'm gonna ask, you know, why is it the cities fail? Either by not including people or by not allowing certain types of people to interact with other types of people or by you know, creating a legal environment, which means that if you were to interact, even if you were spatially close, you would be expropriated, you would be taken advantage of. All of these things are different ways in which interactions can fail. And then finally, I'm gonna talk about how we can make sure that the interactions that flourish in cities produce good rather than harm. Urban proximity, the same face-to-face -face connection that enables you to share an idea or a smile also enables you to share a, a, an illness. And dealing with these downsides of density, which includes crime, contagious disease, traffic congestion, is also, of course, the big challenge of, of urban governance. Okay, now first I'm gonna give you a little bit of a historical, uh, historical tool. These are two iconic images from New York in my youth. Right, so I was born on, on the island of Manhattan in 1967, and this was, you know, this was my childhood, right? Um, and it really felt as if, you know, not just President Ford, but history itself was telling New York to drop dead. The larger image is Jimmy Carter wandering through the wasteland of that the South Bronx had become, where it really felt as if these once proud towers were going to be reclaimed by the weeds. Now, the backdrop for this is that New York, like all of our older, colder industrial cities, had been formed around a transportation network, right? They were formed around waterways, they were formed around rails, right? I and mean, if you go back 200 years in 1816, it cost as much to move goods 30 miles over land as it did to ship them across the entire Atlantic Ocean. And one of the great jobs of the, of the 19th century was to create the, the forms of, of technology that connected America and enabled moving resources across space. And cities were nodes on that lattice of trade. 
right? They were the pinch points uh, on this, where you move from the Atlantic trade to either boats going up the uh, Hudson River to the Erie Canal or rails, right? Over the course of the 20th century, right, the transportation cost advantages that had been created by rails and ships were largely eroded by a general decline in the cost of moving goods. This is just one mode. This is rail shipping. And you have roughly a 90% decline in the cost of moving a ton of mile by rail. And this is not even taking into account what was happening in terms of highways or airplanes or any of the other things that meant that whereas it was really important to have a garment district right next to Penn Station in 1930, that was irrelevant by 1980. Okay. These changes in transportation technology also changed the way that we lived. Instead of the old model, right, where we lived around public transportation centers, we took the elevated rail cars, we took street cars, we walked to work, the car took over. And so we rebuilt our living spaces around the automobile, right? Both in the new world, but, and, and somewhat less so, but also in, in the old. Right? The work of Nate Baum Snow shows that each new highway that cut through the center of a metropolitan area reduced the central city's population by about 18% relative to the metropolitan area as a whole. One way of understanding what these declining transportation costs did was they freed people up to move to places that they wanted to live. And it is a, an odd fact that there's no variable that better predicts metropolitan area growth during the 20th century than January temperature, right? Now, there are at least three things bound up in this. So January temperature is associated with more pro-business policies after 1950. Right? And the work of Tom Holmes looking at uh, border, borders between states really shows the power of being in a, a relatively pro-business environment to attract manufacturing uh, after 1950. Um, it's also associated with making it easy to mass produce housing. You do not understand the growth of places like Atlanta, Dallas, Phoenix, and Houston without understanding just how much more uh, easier it is to build large amounts of housing in a short period of time there, largely because of a different approach to housing regulation, largely because they make it easy to build rather than hard to build. But let's face it, it also reflects the fact that people seem to prefer Florida winters to Detroit and Boston winters. And I can say, as a transplanted New Englander, I think it shows a terrible lack of character on the part of America. Um, OK, so cheap transport killed urban industry like New York City's garment trade. You know, the largest industrial cluster in the United States in the 1950s was not automobile production in Detroit. It was garment production in New York City. right? And you saw this massive urban exodus. Most of what I've told you is all about metropolitan areas. So this means this is going to be the overall urban labor market surrounding the city. This is just a fact about central cities. So these are the political units of cities. So this includes both the move away from the, the frost belt, from, uh, but also the move to the suburbs. As you can see, eight out of the 10 largest cities in America in 1950 had lost more than 20% of their population over the next 50 years. And in three of them, they had lost 48% or more of their population. So a massive hollowing out of, of these places. But um, it didn't end there. And that's the sort of interesting thing, that in fact, in the 1980s, right, the beginning of the 1980s, it really felt as if in some sense the urban story was over. When Alvin Toffer was writing in 1980, he had this prediction that you know, information technology was going to do to urban knowledge industries what you know, container ships and highways had done to urban, urban production. He predicted that we would all decamp to electronic villages and just dial it in. Well, for 40 years, he's been completely and totally wrong because in fact, we had this remarkable comeback of cities. And this is just one decade. So th this is 2000 to 2010. Per capita income is along the, uh, in, in blue. These are the 3,000 odd counties in the United States and I've ordered them on the basis of their density level. The densest tenth of America's counties are the incomes that are 50% higher than the least dense half of America's counties. This is, you know, there is a, now a vast literature in economics on so-called agglomeration economies, which is the, the link between how much activity there is in a place and how productive that activity is. And there's certainly many things going on there, including selection of different types of people into cities and the fact that there are omitted variables which induce both people to come to an area and induce higher levels of productivity. But I think the overwhelming consensus, at least of, of urban economists, is at least some fraction of this is the fact that we do become more productive, right, when we move into particular areas, which of course is sort of necessary to explain why firms are willing to pay such high rents to be in the center of, of urban cores. The red line is perhaps somewhat more surprising, which shows the link between population density and population growth. So whereas Americans at the start of the 19th century were leaving their dense enclaves on the eastern seaboard to populate the empty spaces between the oceans, at the start of the 21st century, instead of spreading out, we were clustering in. OK. Um, all right. And of course, which cities reinvented themselves was hardly random. So if I were telling this perspective purely from the, from the view of Detroit or Cleveland or St. Louis, 
I would say 1980 is the precursor for 40 years of painful decline, right? But in 1980, you know, Seattle looked the same as St. Louis. It doesn't look anything like St. Louis anymore. I mean, 1971, two jokers put up a billboard on the highway leaving Seattle, asking the last person to leave the city to please turn out the lights. Because just as no one could imagine a GM with a small, a Detroit with a smaller GM, no one could imagine a Seattle with a smaller bar, right? And Boeing had been cutting back on jobs. That's before Amazon, before Starbucks, before Microsoft, before Costco, all of these firms that reinvented themselves. This is, this is Boston, this is Kendall Square, another city that, you know, if you go back to the 1970s, Boston is a grim post-industrial town, right? One of my predecessors in the 1970s said that unless Congress bailed out Cambridge's candy industry, Cambridge was done, okay? Now there's a thriving biotech hub right where that candy industry once, once located. Now, uh, it's not very hard to figure out what predicts which cities in the US did well. It's education. Right? Education is, is above all the determinant of which cities manage to reinvent themselves. This, this is one way of viewing the education success gradient. This is just per capita GDP and share the population with a college degree. The econ term for this is human capital externalities. Uh, Jim Rausch is the person who first put this on the map empirically uh, 30 years ago. Enrico Moretti has probably done more on this than anyone else. Um, the typical fact is as the share of adults in your metropolitan area with a college degree goes up by 10%, your, years of, your earnings also go up by 10% holding your years of schooling constant. So it's sort of the, the economic benefits of having smart people around you. Um, this shows the relationship between initial share of the population with college degree and subsequent population growth. So skills beget su subsequent population growth. This has been a fact we've known again for about 30, 30 odd years um, since, since some of my work started documenting it early in the night. Um, and there's a way of thinking about this, which is in fact, even though what technologies did is they enabled us to connect virtually they enabled us to you know, use fax machines and, and uh, cell phones. They also radically increased the returns to being smart. They radically increased the returns to innovation. And we are a social species that gets smart by being around other smart people. And that's what the simple mechanical view of Toffler missed. That in fact, in many ways, electronic interactions and face-to-face -face interactions are complements rather than substitutes. And that's what seemed to come out. And if you think about it, I just have a couple of images here. This is the Googleplex, right? prior to 2019, of all the companies in the world that should have been enabling long distance communication and working from home, it would have been Google. That was the last thing they did. They bought the Google Place. They tried to get everyone on top of each other, like communicating constantly with each other. Uh, this is the Wallace office at Bloomberg LLP, which is based on the wall, sorry, this is the Wallace office at Bloomberg City Hall, which is based on the Wallace office at Bloomberg LLP, which is based on the Solomon Brothers trading floor, right? If you think about it, trading floors are kind of an anomaly, right? They're incredibly dense places and they've got incredibly rich people in them who in normal industries, these people would be sitting in large offices protected by desks, uh, enjoying all the perquisites of privacy that their wealth has made possible, right? Here they are, they're on top of each other. They're, you know, they're sweating on each other. They're yelling at each other. Why are they there? They're there for one reason, because in their industry, knowledge is more important than space. That's in some sense why the city came back. Anyone who's ever taught knows the hard part about teaching is not knowing your subject material, it's knowing whether anything you're saying is getting through to your students, right? We have these wonderful cues for communicating comprehension or confusion that are lost when we're not in the same room with one another. That's what face-to-face -face contact still does. And I think certainly for those of us who had to go through teaching over Zoom, right, this was terrible, okay? This was a really awful experience. Um, and you know, if, particularly with larger, with larger groups. So um, the... The, you know, the more complicated the world is, the easier it is to get lost in translation and the more valuable face-to-face -face contact is. And so th those cities that were specialized in knowledge industries, those cities that had workers who were highly skilled were able to reinvent themselves in a way that other cities were not. Um, now, other variables predict which cities have done well, right? I have a, I'm sort of a human capital determinist, but I don't actually particularly believe the hum important human capital is that that's learned in schools. Many things are, are what's learned on the city streets. Um, and I can't think of any sort of urban skill that's more valuable for long-run innovation than the talent and inclination to be an entrepreneur. 60 years ago, the economist Benjamin Chinitz was comparing New York and Pittsburgh and noting that New York appeared to be more resilient than Pittsburgh was even then. He argued that this was a legacy of Pittsburgh's industrial past, which featured this you know, large vertically integrated steel industry, which did not create entrepreneurs, trained company men. Right? And those men, and they were almost all men, were, were basically incapable of retooling themselves when the steel industry faltered. By contrast, New York had this industry with very few barriers to entry, very weak economies of scale, which was a mother of entrepreneurship, the garment trade. And those garment entrepreneurs went on to do a lot of other stuff. 
right? They went on to form movie studios, they went on to found banks, they went on to build skyscrapers, because this form of human capital appears to be somewhat fungible. It is remarkable, given how weak our measures of entrepreneurship are, that they do such a good job of predicting employment growth over the last 50 years. This is just the average establishment size. You can also use the share of employment in, uh, a, in, in new establishments. They both do equally well. This survives basically any set of controls that you want to do it. You want to use Chinitz's own idea and try to use the presence of coal mines 100 years ago as, as a source of exogenous variation where you have large firms. That also works. Um, but you know, small firms, entrepreneurial human capital appears to be the other thing that was really important. Okay, now just a quick thing, and it was mentioned um, that I care about my students, and it's certainly true. At this point in time, I am prouder of anything my students have done than anything that I do, and that's just a basic, basic fact. And um, this role of cities as, as the role of face-to-face -face contact is being important for learning still appears to be true, and it appears to be one of the reasons why I'm deeply skeptical that Zoom is gonna remake the world. Um, this is from the work of Natalia Emanuel and Emma Harrington, two former students in our department, who look, if this is all pre-COVID, these are workers in a large American retailer who are remote, workers who are not remote. It looks at their probability of being promoted. Okay, and what you can see is even though they find, just like the earlier work of the great Nick Bloom, that sending call center workers home, they can still make as many calls. There's no loss in short-run productivity. Both papers, though, find exactly the same thing, which is your probability to be promoted drops by 50%. Okay. Now, what does it mean to be promoted for these workers? It means you get handled the tough calls. How would your boss know that you were any good at handling tough calls if you were not there? How would you learn how to handle tough calls if you weren't there, right? This whole learning channel gets shut down. That, in some sense, is the cost of going, of going remote. Okay, first question, done. Now we're gonna do stuff that's more recent. Okay, three, three questions. One of which is, right, why do we miss interactions? One reason is we don't have enough people who are able to come to cities. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, okay? And this relates to a, a research vein of mine, which has been for the past 20 years, about the cost of over-regulation of housing in the US. The fact that we don't allow enough affordable housing to be built in the places that are productive. Then I'm going to talk about the segregation within cities of the young. This draws on some recent work with uh, Cody Cook and Lindsay Courier and of Brazilians. And then the failure to provide protection for female entrepreneurs in Zambia. I'll go over relatively quickly on all of, all of these. Um, in some sense to me, America's largest unsolved social problem prior to COVID was the rise of prime age joblessness. Um, I'm gonna focus on male joblessness. There's a reason for that, which is that prime age male joblessness is almost always a sign that something's wrong, right? There are, there are and if you look at American Time Use Survey data on what jobless men do, right? Like I know the New York Times manages to run an article on like how there's this great guy who's at home who's taking care of all the stuff. That's like one guy, okay? The rest of them are, you know, the, what basically you see is a massive amount of time watching television, although Eric Hurst of Chicago tells us that video gaming may have eaten into their time watching television. Whereas women who are not formally employed are typically working. They're caring for other people, they're doing other stuff. And it's just a, it's just a very different phenomenon. It's, it's just difficult to group them together. Prime age male joblessness has increased from about 5% when I was born 55 years ago to over 15% for most of the past 15 years. Okay, so it's a very big difference. And it is one that is very spatially non-even. Okay, so you can see that there are sort of, there's a West Coast cluster, which is very much sort of this, this belt over here. Although these tend to be fairly lightly, lightly populated counties. And there's the Eastern heartland, which is an area that starts down, down in Louisiana and Mississippi, runs up through Appalachia and ends in the cities of the Rust Belt. Right? In some of these areas, more than one in four prime age men are jobless, and they're often jobless for a very long period of time. And joblessness, whether or not you're looking at, at despair as measured by happiness data or suicides or broken families, all of joblessness just looks categorically worse than just being a member of the working poor. Right? It just looks different along, along every dimension. Now, when I think about less skilled Americans in cities, um, I, I sort of at least am hopeful that urban entrepreneurs will figure out things for people without degrees from MIT to do if they're able to trade their labor with people who do have degrees from, from MIT in a large urban area. I have no idea what less skilled Americans are gonna do in West Virginia going forward. Not the foggiest idea. And in some sense, the natural thing would be for Americans to move to places where you know, they are, are they're not jobs, to places where there are jobs, which is after all, what has been the course for the last 250 years of American history, from the time when the farmers in Rocky New England went to the rich uh, Ohio River base, you know, from the time when farmers in, in the South went to find employment in cities like Birmingham, right? Or people fleeing the Dust Bowl moved to, moved to California. 
all of these areas, America has always had geographic churn with directed migration from poor places to rich places. The work of Peter Ganong and Shoag show us that that directed migration really stopped in the last 30 years. One reason for that is that over a third of these jobless men are actually living in their parents' homes. Other of them have people who they are living with who have a, have a, have a salary. They may be married to them, they may not be. Right? Those people are not likely to provide them with a you know, studio apartment in San Francisco. That's not likely to happen. And so the housing keeps them in place. And one of the reasons why housing has become so determinative right, is that in fact, we've made it so much harder to build in key areas. And this is very much, this, this slide is meant to just make the point that housing supply matters. Along the x-axis is how much building we did between 2000 and 2013. And this is from a Journal of Economic Perspectives paper of mine in 2018 with Joseph Jerko. Along the y-axis is the difference between how much it costs to build a house and how much it costs to buy a house. Okay, so a number like three means it costs three much, three times more to buy a house than it does to build a house using construction cost estimates, MAR estimates. What you can see here is the places that build a lot aren't expensive, and the places that are expensive don't build a lot. Okay, that is not compatible with the view that the only thing that matters is some people like to live in some cities and some and other people don't like to live in those same cities. Right? There is abundant demand for both Austin, Texas, and for San Francisco. But Austin, Texas historically stayed cheap because they made it very, very easy to build. Right? San Francisco was expensive because they didn't. These are choices that we're making that lock people out of San Francisco. And whether or not you believe the exact estimates of, of Chang Tishe and Moretti, who come up with a huge estimate of what's costing American growth because we don't allow people to move to productive areas or not, there's no question this is making America less productive and less fair than it could be. Um, this is just one way of thinking about this in terms of the, the time series in, in Los Angeles. Uh, the, the blue line is the rising real rent in LA. The orange line is declining construction in the LA area. And LA still builds a lot more than San Francisco does, right? We've increasingly shut down building. California was a builder's paradise through the 1960s and it stayed affordable despite the same sunshine that it has today. Uh, but, you know, it, we increasingly built less and less and it's got more and more expensive. One way to see the downside of this, and this borrows from uh, both the Jerko land use uh, uh, index and the work of my colleague Raj Shetty and his co-authors to create measures of upward mobility for the cohort that was born between 1978 and 1983. And we've sorted metropolitan areas on how good they are for upward mobility. And then we ask how restrictive these metropolitan areas are on average in terms of the Wharton Index. And what you can see here is the, most, the highest opportunity areas in the country, the places where poor people are most likely to turn into rich, rich people, are the areas that have put up the greatest number of barriers to building. They made it the hardest to build. One of the things that highly educated people do when they move to an area is they figure out how to shut out outsiders. And that's in some sense the tragedy of this. In some sense, it's very Manker Olson, if you will. It's very much about sort of insiders figuring out how to lock out outsiders and freezing America in place. Okay, first point, locking out people outside of cities. Second point, what's going on in cities? And this will again draw from Raj's data and the Opportunity Atlas data. Uh, along this side, this is population density and per capita GDP. Same positive thing that I've been telling you all about, you know, all sorts of great stuff about, about you know, cities being great for adults. In fact, they're not just great for adults in a sort of a static sense. If you come to cities, you experience faster wage growth. So it's sort of a dynamic engine of human capital. This is the same measure of population density applied to Raj's average upward mobility. Okay? So the same cities, the same dense places, which are great for adults, seem to be terrible for kids. This is within uh, within cities, so this is density within cities, okay, going, going gets, gets sharply lower once you get to the high density areas. And of course, if you look particularly at, at segregation along the x-axis, is and this relates to work that was in the Laura's job market paper as well, if you look at uh, black-white uh, segregation and upward mobility across metropolitan areas, you see the same negative sign, okay? Again, pointed to the view that mixing is a crucial part of enabling people to, to do well. I think I did my first work on racial segregation in the US in the early 1990s, actually with David Cutler, right? And you know, for, we found very strong negative effects on African-American outcomes for you know, younger people growing up in these areas. Then there was a brief moment in which the results in the movement to opportunity experiment seemed to suggest that none of that was right when you, had, when you had actually experimental evidence. And now when we actually follow kids who get moved into less segregated areas earlier, we now in fact find what we thought we believed beforehand, which is in fact segregation is really, really hard uh, for kids. Um, now, 
this is just the last fact about this upward mobility. This is the average regression discontinuity at the, at the outside of center city school districts. Big jump up in upward mobility once you get outside central city school districts and a big jump down in your probability of being incarcerated as an adult um, uh, in these areas. Now, what can possibly explain this? And I, I, I must say this is more of a hypothesis than something that we've particularly proven. But um, if you think about the life of an adult, in a, in a city. The work of Susan Athey, Matt Shenskow, and their co-authors on experience segregation tells us what we should have known already, which is that most adults in cities, even if they wake up in a highly segregated area, live fairly integrated lives, right? They go into work in service sector jobs often where they're actually interacting with rich people, middle income people, educated people, less educated people, right? What, what's the life of a kid like? You wake up in a segregated area, you go to a segregated school that may be more segregated to your area, you go home to play when you're segregated. Thing. You live a life that's just totally different in terms of the level of segregation. Um, unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, if we care a lot about privacy, but the, the, it's very hard to get cell phone records that can give you the experience segregation of children. The best that we were able to do to identify kids is people who spent the preponderance of their time in a school district, in a school during the, during the daytime hours, which means that we're, and since we're restricted to being over 16, we're getting a lot of janitors and teachers relative to actual kids in our kids sample. So like, this is not a, this is a very messy thing, but it is striking. So this is the, the impact of segregation, on how, many, how many different places you go to over the course of a day. I mean, it's a really sharp decline with density. So this is within CBSA density. So the people who, the kids who live in these densest areas just have much less moving around than the kids who live in less dense areas. There's a slight negative gradient for adults as well, but it's much less pronounced. With adults and kids, you see that the kids actually spend much less time at school. The adults spend more time at work as you get, as you get denser. So it's sort of an opposite pattern of these things. I don't know that this will ever go anywhere because it's just so far to actually really identify with the kids, but this idea that experience segregation is very different for different age groups feels to me at least one potential way to square the circle of how cities are good for adults and relatively bad for, relatively bad for kids. The last thing, this is work that I've been doing with uh, Radio Barza and um, Martina Viarengo and Cesar Hidalgo using the race data for Brazil. Brazil is a really interesting city, country to work on because it's the poorest country where you can actually use administrative data and trust it, right? So if you go much poorer than that, you're going to have too large of a fraction of the population that are outside of the, of the formal sector to be able to put any weight on this stuff. Um, we're following the, the techniques of De La Roca and Puga on this in estimating city premia. All of this uses individual fixed effects regressions. And the first thing we're just showing you is the sit relationship between city size and premia for initially poor people. So we identify people who start off as poor and what, the, what does the impact they get from being in the city. You can see there is a city size premium. It does get bigger as the cities get bigger. That's what those two lines do. There's a huge difference between the North and the South. Okay, The Southern cities, which tend to be wealthier, tend to be uh, um, more European in feel are much richer than the Northern cities. Both of them have a positive size gradient. Now, what explains the difference? Over here, we're just showing you the segregation of less and more skilled people at the company level. So one of the interesting things about the race data is instead of calculating segregation at the neighborhood level, you can calculate segregation at the company level. It's hugely correlated with how effective the city is for poor people, right? It explains basically 70% of the North-South premium is that in fact, the Northern companies are just much more segregated. They're much more monofunction companies that have uh, unskilled people working on their own, whereas the southern companies are much more like normal American companies where you have a mixture of skilled and unskilled people in them. This is suggestive evidence. It's not a, it's not a thing in which one can prove this, but the same, it doesn't seem crazy to me that all the evidence that we've had that's focused on segregation at the neighborhood would also be true for segregation at the firm level. Okay, last thing, I'm, I, um, how, do I, how long do I have until Anna? Uh, okay, the, the last thing I, I want to talk about is, is about trust, cities, gender, and the law. So this is joint work with Naja Ashraf, Ashraf and Alexia Delfino. Um, the rise of mass urbanization in weak states means that you have places in which rule of law can do very little to protect the vulnerable. Um, the benefits of urban interaction are limited by the ability to work collaboratively and to trust one another. This is basically trying to make the cost that case that rule of law and urbanization are strong complements, right? If you're all out by yourself on the frontier, you don't need the law book nearly as much as you do when you have people who are close to, close to each other. Women are disproportionately at risk from male expropriation, right? The threat of violence looms over intergender bargaining, and courts may also be biased against women. So they may either lose because of formal judicial uh, rulings or because of the, the shadow loss of violence. 
And this idea, and there's a mathematical model that goes with this, is very much motivated by, in fact, the you know, ethnographic work that Nava and Alexia have done in Zambia, where, which just highlights actually the importance, even to quantitative economists, of actually having the kind of ethnic, ethnographic work that the SSRC has championed for 100 years, that in fact, this is what the women talk about. They say, we don't deal with the men because they steal our stuff, or they try to hit on us, or they do other things, right? And they're just a pain in the neck to deal with. Um, consequently, the benefits of cities can be lower for women. Just show you a couple of facts, so, so just a global perspective on this. This is from the World Bank Enterprise Survey. This just shows the share of entrepreneurs who are women across different parts of, of the poorer parts of the world. Overwhelmingly, these places down here where you have 5% or less, these are almost all Arab countries until you get to India at the bottom end. The high end, it's very interesting. It's Southeast Asia and it's the Balkans, right? That are the places that have the highest uh, female representation. Um, Things like, this is the Restricted Physical Integrity Index from SIGI, so you can read what, the, what this is giving a measure of in terms of the long-standing cultural uh, things that this is associated with, very strongly negatively associated with female entrepreneurship, and rule of law is also negatively associated. And in fact, there seems to be a complementarity between the two of them, which is related to this idea that you need both rule of law and some degree of cultural norms which actually, actually are respectful of women. And this is just a way of seeing this. So these are the places that both have good contracts and have less discrimination within the family. That's where all the places with relatively high levels of female entrepreneurship are. So in either up there, 36% of firms are owned by women, as opposed to 22 in this one, 22 in this one, 18 in this one. Now, our you know, main work for this, this paper involves actually a census of business in Zambia and some lab in the field work in Zambia. This is a, a census that uh, Nava and Alexia put together, basically all of the businesses in, in Zambia. There are also these institutions called markets, which basically have a local judicial function. So you have a market chief who can kick you out of the market uh, if you misbehave. Um, women in Zambia are overwhelmingly in two industries, apparel and food, right? That is true uh, in, across the world as well. Women tend to be very segregated in these two uh, industries. Now, one reason for this may be the skills that are particular to traditional women's tasks. Another thing that people talk about, and I'll show you evidence for it, is in fact that way they can partner with other women. And I think when we think about gender and field in our own academic disciplines, that may be another reason why in fact particular fields have plenty of women and other fields don't, is because it makes it possible to find women to partner with who are less likely to expropriate them. Um, for example, this just shows the gender gap in partnership between apparel and all other industries. So if you look, this is buying together, lending, sharing advice, sharing order, and just the average cooperation, if you're in apparel, women and men are the same, okay? If you're in every under, other industry, there's a whopping cooperation gap. Women are just much less likely to do other things in these predominantly male industries. Um, this is my favorite single fact in this paper, which is I've long believed that, you know, this line of Alfred Marshall, the great 19th century English economist, that in dense clusters, the mysteries of the trade become no mystery, but ours were in the air, right? In the case of men, right? Men are overwhelmingly being taught their skills either by an entrepreneur in the same business or by some family member. They're learning from someone that's in the air. Women, they're paying for formal school, right? And so this whole sort of cooperation learning channel that's working for the men is just not, not working for the women. This, by the way, is what a market looks like in Lusaka. You can see one of these things is a wood-related market. The other one does uh, apparel. Um, and the whole power of the market chief is he can kick you out. Often there's some threats of physical violence as well. Um, we find that um, in terms of the average cooperation, that if you're outside a market, that's where the gaps are most pronounced between women and men. So it's in the lawless space without the market chiefs. If you're in a market where it's predominantly male, the difference gets smaller. Okay? Um, if you're in a market that's predominantly female, the difference disappears entirely. Like if anything, women trust more than men. Um, we've also gone through and surveyed these judges, and there are an, it is an eight-question survey to try and get at the degree of gender bias on the part of the of the, the, the market chief, we find a fairly significant impact of the interaction between are you a woman do, and the gender bias of the market chief. So gender biased market chiefs appear to be much worse for inducing cooperative behavior on the part of the women. We also ran a trust game with access to a chief who was de-biased by blindness using the classic technique of Cecilia Rouse and Claudia Golden of basically exacting a screen. screen. This was very natural in, a, uh, in the case of, an, of a trust game. Um, and in this case, when you had access to the chief, the degree of trust difference between men and women basically disappeared once you had access to this chief who could punish uh, people who misbehaved. And it ended up giving both women and men who participated in these, these things much more, uh, much higher returns in the trust game from having this, this institution. 
Okay, so that ends the second part of this. So rule of law, integration, and affordable housing. Um, and the third part that I'm just gonna talk briefly about is dealing with the downsides of density. This is um, uh, in Mumbai's Dharavi slum, which is on one level, a completely amazing place in terms of just the level of human productivity there. I mean, you just walk through the place and it's just full of amazing Indian entrepreneurs who are, you know, there's one cluster and there are guys who are, are sewing women's undergarments who feel like you're like in the lower east side of Manhattan in 1905. And then you go a little bit further and there's a ceramics cluster and they're so proud of their pots they won't take any money from you. And then you move a little bit further and there, there are people who are recycling plastics. You know, how the hell do they learn how to make this, make this stuff? And, and figure out that it would pay. And of course, the, it was the city that gave them that information. It was the city that taught them that. It showed just very much the promise of a place like this. And then of course you go outside and you see a kid defecating in an unpaved road. You know, the electricity is intermittent and you know, the water isn't fit to drink. And it reminds you of all these downsides, these demons that come with density that need to be tamed for these cities to seem reasonable. We have become particularly attuned to one downside over the past three years because of the return of urban plague. Okay, plague is an old companion of urban life, right? Our first well-chronicled urban plague is the plague of Athens, 430 BCE. And we have a great record of it because Thucydides was there. And of course the backstory for this is Athens is doing all that you could possibly ask a city to do in the, in the fifth century, right? It's doing miraculous things by connecting smart people in the arts and architecture and sculpture. Uh, it's doing remarkable things in, in playwriting. It's doing remarkable things in mathematics, uh, in philosophy. Um, it's an economic powerhouse, it's a military powerhouse. All that success excited the uh, rivalry of their land-based competitor Sparta, charged Pericles that he needed to stand down from the leadership of the Delian League. Pericles was taking no guff, the Peloponnesian War was on. Per Pericles has a cunning plan. He's gonna summon the Athenians and their Attic allies behind the walls of the city, trusting to those walls to keep out the Spartan hoplites. The strategy works perfectly well militarily. It does work, right? And there, the flip side of this is Pericles sends out the vastly superior Athenian fleet to harass the, the Peloponnesian coastline. The problem is walls that keep out an enemy warrior may not keep out a bacteria, a bacteria or virus, and something entered in through the port of Piraeus that laid waste to the city. Current estimates are about one in four Athenians died over a two year period. So that would be a death rate about a hundred times that of, of COVID-19. And in some sense, the city never really recovers, right? It soldiers on for another quarter century before finally losing, but it sinks from being you know, the New York of the Eastern Mediterranean world to maybe being the Philadelphia, to maybe being the New Haven. Uh, and you know, its, it's glory is, is dimmed forever. Um, this comes from work with Steve Redding, who is pleasantly here. Uh, so um, we've had uh, we, the, the you know, plague came again to our cities and we're able to observe it in ways that we never used to before. And I think the theme of this paper is the downsides of connection, the downsides of the interaction that we've just extolled. So this is cases, let's say, as of late May 2020. Uh, this is also joint work with uh, Caitlin Borback. Uh, and it shows you that, in fact, it's not the densest parts of New York that got the disease. It's the least dense parts. Right? It's not Manhattan. It's not, uh, it's not where the SSRC's offices are. It, it's in the outlying borough. Why is that? How can you explain this weird inverted Sort of thing, right? We normally think that cities spread, spread disease both because they're this, these places that connect across continents and also because people live close to one another. And this was true in Mumbai, right? I mean, the remarkable serological work of Anup Milani tells us that Mumbai slum residents, more than half of them had COVID-19 by July 2020, okay? But not in New York. What happened? What was different with this? Well, because we have cell phone records, right, we're able to see what happened to mobility, right? And we know that people who lived in Brooklyn Heights and people who lived in downtown Manhattan had a much sharper reduction in mobility than the people who lived in the out, outer boroughs. Our preferred estimates using a variety of perhaps debatable instrumental variable strategies, Steve, I don't know if we want to, <laughs> but our strategies which essentially use the fact that some areas had more uh, uh, necessary emergency needed uh, occupations and other areas had more people who could work remotely. Those things were very predictive as to which ones had more or less trips. Um, our estimates are that a 10% reduction in trips during this time period was associated with a 20% reduction in cases, right? Now, of course, it's not as if we think that people in Manhattan were somehow they're smarter or better behaved. They were just luckier. They were just better educated. They were just richer. They just had the freedom to do things remotely. And it's important to recognize just how enormous the education gap was in remote working, right? As of May 2020, 68.9% of Americans with advanced degrees were working remotely. 5% of Americans who were high school dropouts were working remotely, an enormous gulf. And that education gulf also partially explains the incredible difference in the death toll from COVID in more or less educated places. 
So you remember I showed you earlier the sort of skills doing good things in terms of, ur uh, in terms of productivity and urban growth. This just shows share with the population of the BA or more, the total death rate from COVID-19. That's twice as high in the less educated parts of America than it is in the less educated parts of America. Sort of amazing thing. Um, now, the good thing is about urban disease uh, is that we actually have centuries of records on trying to fight it, right? But in fact, the 19th century was a great era of proto-urbanization, and it was a great era for plague as well, right? The early 19th century is a period in which first yellow fever, which emerges out of Africa, comes over to the Caribbean, comes up to the uh, cities of the Northeast, and then co cholera, which emerges in a particularly virulent form in Ganges in 1817, travels over land with the English army, travels over land with the Tsar's army, comes to New York in 1831, 32. Um, these diseases are uh, both fundamentally contagious, but the way that we fought them actually was the triumph of a high, very practical implication of an incorrect doctrine. But in fact, the, the things that we did that really mattered were bringing in clean water, right? Bringing in sewers, cleaning the swamps, right? All of which were the recommendations, not of the good contagionists we now know were right, but in fact, of the miasma theorists, right? Who thought that the disease was being spewed out of the swamp. And it's one of those fortuitous things where getting the science wrong ended up meaning that we got the public health right. Um, and this was an enormous undertaking. America's cities and towns were spending as much on clean water at the start of the 20th century as the federal government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army, right? And the death rates went down enormously. But, and I wanna emphasize this, right? The, one of the lessons you should take away from this is it's not just about engineering. Because if you thought, as I was raised as a child to believe that, you know, New York was filthy, then the great engineers built this quote, an aqueduct, and then all of a sudden New York was clean, right? Then you would expect to see some huge trend break in 1842 when the quote, an aqueduct opens. No. 25 more years we're getting uh, cholera epidemics. My great, 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 great grandfather died in that one, the 1849 cholera epidemic in New York, right? And the reason for this is the same problem we have in Sub-Saharan Africa today, which is the last mile problem, okay? Which is the fact that you have these, these, uh, this aqueduct, you have these sewage systems, and people aren't you know, able to pay for the connections to them. And it's not until 1866, you can see the break there, when the Metropolitan Board of Health starts imposing fines on tenement owners who don't connect to the water system that you solve this last mile problem that the death rates go down, right? You need both incentives and institutions in order to, incentives and engineering in order to make our cities workable. Um, this again comes from work with, Na with uh, Nava in Zambia. I'm just gonna show you three slides on this. This is from, uh, this is water related work. Um, water breaks a lot, Zambia. Water breaks a lot in lots of poor parts of the world. So you both have a last mile problem, but these dark areas, which typically are poor, typically they have between two and three days a week that we have estimates of some kind of water supply problem in these areas, right? Not to mention the fact that they don't have water outside of um, prime working hours. We use the relatively random timing of when these breaks are to try and estimate what these breaks do. We find that they aren't just related to things like you know, bad diarrheal problems when the water breaks, but also actually to higher levels of measles, which could be associated with either weakness from the, the diarrhea or from failing to wash your hands. As we've known, sort of washing your hands seems to also be useful in terms of stuff. But I wanna highlight just this last thing, which is the strongest correlate of these, you know, of, of having supply problems is actually just the share of connections that are metered. And this is sort of an interesting suggestive thing, but you can pay for your water either by the liter or by the month in Zambia. If you pay by the month, there's no incentive for the water company to fix your pipes. If you pay by the liter, there is. And it turns out that there's just a much higher rate at which they fix the pipes when it's paid for by the liter than when it's paid for by the month. Um, the same point about meaning incentives is also true in terms of roads, right? We know from the work of Gilles Darnton and Matthew Turner that if you just build highways, you just get more driving, right? It's only if you have things like congestion pricing that you actually start dealing with these downsides of density. And I'm gonna end on this, which is actually the newest work I have. This is joint work with Lindsay Courier and Gabriel Kreindler. Through the kindness of my former student, Jonathan Hall, who's the chief economist at Uber, we have a month's worth of sort of universal data from Uber from the US. And the great thing about Uber GPS data is it's not just in two dimensions, it's in three dimensions. So we don't just know how fast these drivers are going, we know how bumpy they are. So from this, we have measures of road roughness essentially everywhere in the US. And so this is like what one of these things will show, will look like. So this is a trip to, uh, to O'Hare, right? So from O'Hare here, it starts out bumpy, it gets smooth on the highway, it gets bumpy again, okay? Um, this is Chicago, the darker areas are redder. They also, a typical gap within Cook County is African-American predominantly areas have, standard, have road roughness is 0.6 standard deviations higher than predominantly white neighborhoods. 
I'll show you more on that in, in New York. There are some tricky things with this data because if you drive more quickly, it gets bumpier. Now, when the Department of Transportation does this for highways, they've never done this for local roads. They actually just send their guy out at two o'clock in the morning and say, you're driving at 50 miles an hour, right? And so there's no problem with that. That's not our data. So we have to filter this thing out. It turns out we have just enough data that we can actually do that. And we can actually, we think, do a quite good job of dealing with this. A um, Couple of facts that you wanna take away from this. So each of this is a, is a standard deviation difference. This is just looking at the 818 metro areas that we have in New York. Um, and this just shows the, the share of the population that's African-American. That's, again, about a 0.6 standard deviation gap between predominantly African-American towns and predominantly white towns in the New York metropolitan area. Um, there also is an income gap, right, that's also pretty significant. Um, the race effect is still quite strong controlling for income. This is not just about, about um, income. The effect across the U.S. is somewhat, I mean, it's still there. It's still a, a whopping thing. It's 0.5 standard deviations between the lowest and the highest uh, across areas. The income gap is ameliorated across areas. And there's an odd fact that uh, McAllen, Texas, which is one of the poorest places in America, which uh, has on almost every dimension as, as a social sort of outlier in terms of how badly it does, it has wickedly smooth roads. And I have no idea what's going on with this. I think I need to do a field trip right, right to there. Now, one of the things we can do with this is we can figure out how much we lose from road roughness. So this is, for example, just looking at the gap in road roughness just at the edge of Chicago. So this is Chicago Evanston border, for example, and then just how much speeds go up. So from this, we can figure out basically what are the welfare gains in terms of speeds and just the overall sort of welfare calculation from getting smoother roads. Um, we can estimate what happens with road repaving to, to this stuff. Now, one of the things that's somewhat weird here is the, the Chicago, non-Chicago gap in roughness is almost a full standard deviation. Gains within Chicago from road repaving is like 0.1 standard deviation. It's almost an order of magnitude less, which is, you know, Alora's looking, right? Because it's strange. It's a very strange thing. You think about road repaving, we're going from some place that's sort of really rough, we think, to some place that's perfectly smooth. That's not happening. Okay. So this is road repaving in Chicago on initial roughness. Yes, the ones that are really like nice, we're slightly less likely to repave. But everywhere else, it's basically a flat relationship. We have zero targeting of road repaving in most areas in this, in this country, which is a shocking thing. And no matter what you think about how much America should be spending on infrastructure, right? there's no argument for spending money on infrastructure stupidly and not going after the areas that are rougher rather than the areas that are, that are less rough. And I think going forward, this is just a sign that like, our own country needs to be somewhat smarter about this, not just because it's a question of efficiency, but also because it's a question of equity. In fact, we are particularly harming, particularly subgroups when we do this thing stupidly. But I will end on this, which is I've made this case about, you know, I've spent a lot of time talking about the sort of pathologies of urban, of urban space. And they're real. And they're one of the reasons why weak institutions in poorer countries can make the cities particularly problematic. But I think the larger message is whether or not we're talking about culture or politics or inclusion or opportunity, cities have been doing miraculous things for 2,500 years since Socrates and Plato bickered on an Athenian street corner. Whether or not I think about you know, the streets of, of you know, Roxbury in Boston or the Dharavi slum of Mumbai or uh, just plain old London, right? the age of mir urban miracles is not over. Cities are still doing miraculous things and they will be able to do that for many, many centuries to come. So thank you very, very much. Sure. Uh, Steve. Yeah, um, Steve. One of the ways is nice things, but it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Steve is one of the nicest commenters. On you said many, many um, fascinating things. One of, the thing, one of the findings I found most interesting is this correlation between skills and city growth, which is a core cool feature of a, a bunch of your research over the last 20 years. And also the very very Connection with that to your other finding about the lack of mobility um, in response to negative economic shocks. And so I'm thinking in particular of the results you showed us in American Ireland. So on the one hand, we have these parts of the US which are relatively unskilled, and yet we have a bunch of people that are not moving away despite the collapse of economic opportunity. And I was really curious about your thoughts for the sort of appropriate policy response to that. Contrast to 
eras in the past where we see greater mobility across geographic space. As you mentioned, the moving to California, the great migration of African Americans from the South to the North. And so I was curious if any more thoughts you had about sort of appropriate public policy responses to these declining unskilled regions where we don't see people moving out despite the loss of economic opportunity. So, so it's, a great, it's a great question. And it's a question that obviously that both of us have obsessed about for quite, quite some time. The, um, I think the historic economics view of this would have been just stay out. Like, just let the poor people move to the other areas. It'll all work its way out. And yes, maybe there'll be a slight disproportionate brain drain problem, which is, of course, one of the things you worry about, that the people who get out might be different than the people who stay. But historically, that wasn't a, that big of a deal. And you know, going back to 1950, skills weren't that predictive of urban success. right? It's not as if that this was such a crucial issue. Flash forward 70 years, first of all, getting out becomes much harder, partially because of this housing binding. Uh, uh, but also, the people who get out tend to be the skilled people, and that tends to be much more predictive of you know, which areas are able to reinvent themselves. So it's not even clear that sort of the out-migration that's happening is helpful, whereas in a traditional farm culture, it always would have been helpful. Having few people, so if I think about out-migration from rural farms in sub-Saharan Africa to cities, you know, I don't see any downside in that, right? That's, that seems to be something which, I mean, we've got to deal with the, the cities and the downside to density, but having fewer people on those farms is actually very good for the people who remain on those farms, right? Because in fact, the amount of, you know, the amount of people per land area is, is a crucial determinant of income in a subsistence agricultural economy, which is of course why, right, historically, the Black Death actually made Europe much richer. It was a demographic catastrophe, a human catastrophe, but when you, one third of the population dies, land per capita increases by 50% and wages soar. Um, so, I think we have to be more open to experiment for at least place-targeted policies. So I'm still not at a place in which I think we should be bribing people to live in West Virginia. I think that's a huge, or even bribing businesses to relocate to West Virginia. I don't think that we, we know enough about the shape of agglomeration economies to be confident about that being a sensible uh, strategy from sort of a national productivity uh, point of view. I do think maybe doing a bit more to encourage uh, you know, job creation in these areas wouldn't be a terrible thing. I think certainly experimenting with some sort of ramped up earned income tax credit targeted towards people who are sort of long-term unemployed in these areas is a reasonable thing at least to experiment with. I also think worrying about entitlement reform in these areas is sensible, right? So I think you can easily imagine that you wanted the base level of payment for disability insurance to be lower in West Virginia than in, say, Seattle, but then you would allow it to people to work more in West Virginia than you would in Seattle. So it creates much less of a negative incentive for work than it does in is currently, and certainly the work of Magnus Mogstad tells us when you allow disabled people in, in Norway, in his case, to keep more of their earnings, they work a lot more, right? Um, so I think we can experiment with this stuff. I think just in general, one size fits all policies which tend to come out of Washington often are really problematic, right? So if you take my sort of housing world, the low income housing tax credit, right? Doing, doing things which support people to build, right? Perfectly sensible strategy in much of the Northeast. Right, where we think that the combination of, of regulation and the huge affordable housing problem is such that you know, that's a reasonable thing to do. Crazy thing to do in Houston, Texas. Right? Private market is doing a fantastic job building un incredibly inexpensive housing. We don't need to sort of try and subsidize more of it. It won't make any difference. And it's also unwise in Detroit, where you know, Detroit's a city built for 1.85 million people. It now is less than half of it. What it needs is safe streets and, and you know, better schools for its kids. It doesn't need any sub subsidy of, of low-income housing. Same thing is true for policies like the minimum wage. Tell me you want a $20 minimum wage in Seattle, it, all the evidence is it's not gonna make much of a difference. Tell me you want a $20 minimum wage in West Virginia, I'm gonna be terrified. Or at least I'm gonna be terrified if you're gonna, you know, if you wanna try and do it by subsidizing the wages with, with you know, federal subsidies, then that's fine. But if you're asking the employers to do it, that just feels suicidal. So I think just being smarter about place targeting feels like at least something that we should be trying to do. Because I, I'm certainly no longer in the place where let's say I was 15 years ago, which is just, you know, let people move out, let the business fail, let the market, the market happen. Yes. Um, I just I was curious just in the beginning as we're trying to understand for the United States how different cities grow differently. How much of that is mobility versus birth rates or in almost the United none States? of it in the U.S. Almost none of it is birth rates. It's almost all migra migration. In Sub-Saharan Africa, birth rates become much more important, and the work of Remy Jedwan tells us about that. So, so it does it, it is a thing, but it's much less at least over the past sixty or seventy years in the U.S. Birth rate differences are trivial relative to, to this stuff. So you want to under, you always under, want us to understand this is basically migration driven. So migration is also not important, or is it? No, it is important, but it's still it's still people choosing particular cities. Like, what is the difference between uh, Americans moving from one state to the other versus foreigners coming from Mexico, coming from other places? 
how do they contribute to the differential so, rules? So I still, that's, that's itself an interesting question. From a perspective of thinking about sort of urban growth, we think of them once they're in the US as they're choosing between cities. So they are, you know, in some sense, they're Americans who are opting between places. And I tend not to view them as sort of categorically different. People are people and they're living in America and they're choosing between different locations, which is not to say that like the general issue of where do you know, immigrants go to is an incredibly fascinating uh, thing. And in fact, Leah's right in back of you and I can't think of anyone that you would be better served by having a conversation with after this talk is over in terms of that, that question. So I, I think that's an incredibly interesting question, but I don't, I don't think it's one in which you wanna say, oh, you can't use the same paradigm for thinking about how cities grow uh, on it. Yeah, David. About bumpy roads. Um, yes. And it's related to your response to Steve's question as well. So, is it obvious that we want to repave the bumpy ones? Like, or more broadly, I guess, is it obvious that we want to allocate infrastructure to places that have bad infrastructure, no infrastructure at all? There is a literature that shows that uh, quite often infrastructure placement in rural areas just leads to these areas emptying out, which Maybe a good thing, right? Those people, if those people move to cities and uh, so, have a great perspective, that's great. But it can have these effects uh, that are, you know, not obvious. And because of that, to me, it's not obvious what the objective function should be when it comes to infrastructure. So, you right. It's not obvious that you that you necessarily want to, you know, you're, first of all, you're making sort of a, a national question. And that's, that's certainly fair. This is all, remember, within Chicago, the road repaving. And you're right, even within Chicago, we may be willing to tolerate a bumpier side road much longer than we're able to tolerate a bumpier main road. And all of those things in the full optimization decision need to be taken into account. I can promise you that's not what Chicago's doing, right? That that's not, this is not like this. I know I have not shown that fact to you yet, but uh, if, and I, like, the right thing to do would be to, like, or at least in terms of showing this fact, I would sort of, have in some sense places that are at roads that are equally as important and then I would show you that, that that still doesn't predict very well. The usual way that this works by the way in is that the cities will have some sort of visual thing which tells them if you're below a certain amount you're supposed to be repaved every year okay. Um, it's sort of like Boston for example is rule that every restaurant is supposed to be inspected every year. What share of restaurants do they actually get to? I don't know 40%. Right? What share of roads that are below do they actually get to in, la in a large big city? I don't know, 25%. Right? So they have this rule, which means that basically all of the roads could be repaved because they all are, are below this level, but it doesn't do anything to actually targeting road, road repaving. So that's, that's sort of what's happening. And so you know, they're doing whatever random thing they're, they're doing rather than actually targeting stuff. But um, I, I have not said anything at this point about what the overall level should be or cross metropolitan area repaving should be or anything like that. I've simply pointed out some facts about race and some facts about income. And I've pointed out some facts about, um, you know, you can use this to estimate what the actual gains are from doing this. And I can also tell you that it sure as heck doesn't seem as if within Chicago and the few other cities that I have, that they're doing a very good job of targeting areas that you think of would be more, you know, we'd have the largest needs. Another question or? We have time for maybe one more. Laura. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to the question of suburbs and are they part of the miracle of cities? People seem to really like to live in them or are they uh, demons because they um, are strongly associated with segregation and exclusion? Um, so uh, there's both, both a positive and a normative thing that's that's put up in there. So, so positively, I tend to think of as car, suburbs are car-based living that enables, in, the, in their traditional form, they enable people to have, you know, relatively modest density places to live and still often work in relatively high density areas. So, like, we understand the appeal of that in, in the U.S. for, uh, you know, for, for providing a sort of mixed, a hybrid lifestyle, if you will. And, and certainly, you know, the, the, it's not really a puzzle why, you know, car commuting was so appealing in the U.S. I mean, the average car commute in America is about 25 minutes. The average commute by public transportation is roughly half that. It's roughly twice that, mostly because of the fixed cost of getting to the station, waiting for the thing to show up, and so forth. So um, this isn't particularly shocking. Now, the good and the bad of it, right? So we know it's, like, in terms of the carbon emission side, we know it's bad. But we know there's a big gap between, I mean, the places that look green are brown. The places that look brown are green. This is true holding income and family size constant. My paper on this is called The Greenness of Cities, which was joined with Matt Kahn about 11 years ago. And we control for income and family size and find fairly substantial city size, city suburb gulfs in this that are associated with um, 
basically just driving and the amount of home heating and home cooling that you do. We also find that the places that regulate housing the most are also the, the intrinsically greenest places, which tells you they actually should be building the most if you wanted to lower carbon emissions, right? So coastal California is the greenest place because it's naturally very temperate. But of course, it's the place where environmentalists have themselves blocked out new construction. And when you turn off construction outside of San Francisco, you turn on construction outside of Houston, you turn it on outside of Phoenix, you turn it on in places that are much browner. Um, in terms of mixing, um, uh, you know, it, it's hard to see much good that came out of suburbanization in terms of the integration process. And of course, race is deeply tied up with the history of suburbanization in the West, you know, better than anyone does. Um, the, um, uh, I tend to think of this as particularly pernicious, the fact that we, thanks to the Supreme Court in 1974, right, we, we decided that we could force integration within city boundaries, but not across city boundaries. So that created this added incentive for parents who wanted whiter schools to get outside. That seems, you know, and it's sort of always felt to me deeply ironic that if you even went to like Milton Friedman's dream of like anyone could go to any school that was win a voucher thing and, or you went to like the, the French system where like it's three o'clock on a Thursday afternoon, I know what every French student is learning, right? Either of those things would do less than the sort of American local control over schooling to mean that you sort of, this segregation had such an awful impact on, on outcomes. So, I don't know that we're going to outlaw suburbs, but it's we certainly the, the the fight to try and make cities less harmful for kids, you know, particularly poor kids, particularly kids of color, feels to me like it's you know a battle that still needs to be waged. But I, I'm old, old Laura. It's your battle now. <laughs> it's not quite, but um, um. Oh, wait. <laughs> um, thank you very much.